You know, the day I went in was, it was a nice evening. The wind was coming in, maybe max 15 on shore. And we were going on the Lost Coast to Shelter Cove was our destination from Eureka, California. And um, there was a microburst that happened. It was late in the evening and there was a hot bubble of air that had popped from the valley and it shot out towards us unexpectedly at the most western point in the United States at, uh, at patrol and, and it went from 15 onshore to 30 offshore in a split second. And we're all fly, flying at a, a reasonable altitude. We're at uh, probably six, 650 feet, the three of us. There's a mountain range went, went from sea level to 4,000 feet above us. And so we weren't expecting any rotor. We weren't expecting this microburst that happened, but I wasn't prepared for a water landing because I wasn't expecting it. But I should have been because I was flying near water. Day two, we want to get up in the morning and uh, definitely have another briefing. Uh, we're going to put our radio communication system together get everybody into their designated spots and I'd like to start putting people in the water by nine o'clock or so. Ideally every pilot lands half of that distance yeah. in the middle. Try and get them to do a long glide path so we can more time to get into position yeah. so they're not you know then we'll just boop you know what I mean. So ideally I think every one of these things will be a nice long final so that the boats can see see exactly where the guy's going. The boats you know, he flies right past the boats, and then the boats just chug along like a little armada. He touches down, boats pull up, urge, put the brakes, <coughs> and the divers deploy. You know, if you got gloves on, I think, uh, Matt, you lost the strap down here, and you mm -hmm. thought you were out. Yep. Um, so the sliding straight out and calm seems to be like the most efficient and less energy. So that thing is, I think you guys are onto something there, depending on how much gear you have. I feel like if I deliberately undo each one of those buckles, I know I've got a clean exit. If I was pulling my legs through those leg straps and then my foot got hung up on something, now I can't reach that. That strap's not here anymore. It's down here. That's the only scenario I see there. And, and thinking you're gonna get out of the straps cleanly every time, I don't, I, I don't like that idea. I mean, I, I, I'm gonna land, go into the water, unstrap, see how much impact I take because something could lock up and you could get hung up in that unit. Where I felt if you had two power floats, one went off, you've got that going for it, it's gonna have your head above the water, which it didn't. So it's, uh, it makes it a lot more serious. Basically, right out of the gate, we'll put a pilot in the truck and send him off to the LZ that's only five minutes away and uh, get him in the air. Uh, we're gonna have radio communication, then we can talk back to our two rescue boats and our safety kayaker that'll, that'll be in the water. Uh, we'll get our pilot in the air and he'll ascend to 2,500 feet maybe, I think with some of our testing that we've done. I think that's gonna be a good elevation. Uh, shut off the motor, and at that point we've got the scouts rigged so we can plug the intake, we can plug the exhaust, um, we've got the fuel tank sealed with a closable vent, kind of get up there at 2,500 feet, knock those projects out. Um, yeah, and then once the pilot hits the water, it's gonna be time for the race, uh, the safety crew to jump in place. You know, everybody should try to get out of that thing and make their way to shore. It's not, the mission isn't just to get out of that harness. The game's not over when you get out of that harness. You gotta get yourself to shore. And I suspect that by the time I get to shore wearing all that stuff, the short swim that I took yesterday, I'm gonna probably be bleeding out of my lungs from breathing because I exerted a lot of energy. And that was part of our, our spiel at the big meeting this morning was uh, to not get complacent. We're gonna treat each one of these things as it's the first one throughout the day. Um, just because the first eight go right doesn't mean the ninth one's gonna go right. Uh, you know. We're, we're trying to set ourselves up to expect the unexpected, for sure. Counting starts as soon as face goes down. Okay. And you're going to be motoring a little bit, and if you're not right there, you can be counting to yourself, but as soon as you sh yeah. shut your boat off, really loud, everybody can hear it. 1,008, 1,009, right. and, and we're going to want to know what each one of those persons count is. We Yesterday we were doing a 20 count. 
I think there's going to be some extra stuff to deal with the lines. For me personally, I want a 30 count before anybody touches anything. No, and I really want underwater gestures because if you're under there and you're struggling but you're still doing okay, if you give uh, give Dave an okay symbol, like I got this still, if you need help, is yeah. that right? Start tapping your mouth. Man the battle station! You know, I do have concerns with when we're actually landing in water and what the wing will do and what the lines will do to complicate that process. But without any of that stuff, without the wing and the lines, it's definitely, it seems like a very straightforward process. But I think there's other variables that could affect uh, that outcome and how easy or, or hard it is or impossible to free yourself from the machine. You know, if I have time, I'm definitely, from what I learned yesterday, I'll definitely unbuckle at least everything but one. Maybe all of them, depending on how the approach is and how, uh, how it feels. But uh, I'm kind of more interested in the unexpected, in the water, without any uh, preventative measures taken, just to see how it really goes, see how I handle it. I mean, you never know if you're going to get panicky or stressed in that moment until you're in that moment so I think that's the real test if I go in with no buckles it's going to be a non-event and I don't think uh, it's going to really uh, contribute a whole lot to what we're trying to learn out here. No, and I was kind of hoping to land how I did so I just kind of sank in nice and then I was sitting just kind of balanced right there. So I was kind of on my back and I was fine. I was just right there, balanced. And once they inflated, I did roll. But once they were inflated, it was floating just fine too. So I think I would have been fine even, even rolled to my side a little bit. It was not, there was plenty of flotation. I could easily get my head up for a breath. A guy I know that had a near, had a bad experience with the water landing and it shook him up really good. And uh, seeing his experience with the struggle, uh, recovering from that was, uh, Enough for me to kind of make a promise to myself that I'd never fly without at least uh, some flotation. Definitely beefier you feel it, but once you're in the air, it's not that big of a deal, and it's worth a worth a, a peace of mind, I think. So I'm going with no flotation on the Scout. Um, I'm going to have a little redundancy on myself. I'm going to wear an impact vest, a manual inflate. Uh, life jacket and a manual inflate uh, belt PDF, I guess we would call it. Uh, I'm going to go in one leg strap buckled only. I really feel uh, when I fly low to the water or where I can't put it down on land, that's probably how I'm going to fly after seeing the power floats not right me in the water and they were actually holding me face down. Hmm. Um, I'm not gonna put floats on my scout anymore, but today, uh, today we're gonna see how that works out. Unbuckled. Uh, my chest, waist, and one leg at about 100 feet, uh, maybe even a little less. It that went smooth. Um, I could probably, you know, done it even faster, closer to the water. I feel really good about that. How easy it was to unbuckle close to the water. I just took my hands off the brakes, did it right there. I think you could unbuckle, you know, pretty close to the water if you had to. Uh, I'm probably gonna practice that. And then going in into the wind, I'm gonna call it zero impact with, uh, I think it's blowing close to eight. And I did, I, I went for it. I've never really uh, taken a wrap on a landing, but uh, I took one wrap and waited, waited, and then just checked it really hard at the end and it gave me a little lift and it felt like I went in vertical I did go forward, but zero impact. Um, I immediately uh, reached for my left leg strap that I had on, and I did put my hands through some lines doing that. 
So you're, you know, you, you may think you can get everything unbuckled, but if your hands get tangled in it, I really like the one leg strap uh, uh, put down in there. That felt good. As, as paramotor pilots, we never land downwind. We don't have wheels that can run fast enough for that. Um, so some of these downwinders in the afternoon here and in, in the bay, it'll get blowing, you know, maybe 15, 20 miles an hour. So we're, you know, we're talking maybe entering the water on a downwinder at 40 miles an hour. And I'm pretty sure that any paramotor that lands in the water at 40 miles an hour, their feet are going to hit first and it's going to be a huge face plant. When I was running whitewater all the time, one of the, our biggest fears, and we would use throw bags and ropes sometimes to do rescues, but you're putting a real, you're adding an element of real danger as soon as you put lines in water for entanglement, um, choking, people getting hung up on it. So my biggest fear going into this thing is the lines and entanglement. Um, I mean, we're gonna be intentionally putting way more lines than any river running scenario I've ever seen. I came out and I could see the lines, so I knew I was going to be in lines, but I was only in a few. The impact was just enough to just just slightly disorient me for a second, and then I got right back to work. Yeah, the downwinder, I've never gotten, to, you never land a power glider, a power glider downwind, so it was freaking awesome, smoking in. Woo! So, yeah, I loved it. You know, I unbuckled one, Yeah. very deliberately one, Two, three, four, and then rolled out of the shoulder straps. Just having the experience of being in the water upside down with the motor on your back, you know, I've, I've never experienced that before. And to have that, you know, behind me is, kind of comforting because it really wasn't that bad you know I think the trouble is gonna be of course if you panicked and got hung up getting your buckles undone but more than that uh, the lines and the glider getting wrapped up in that so it's gonna be critical to stay away from all that stuff as much as possible yesterday I kind of did just the chicken strap and swam out of it um, I think in a higher wind scenario that might uh, mess you up if you're swimming out and somehow you get your feet caught and then you're going to have to curl back down and deal with the, the mess that's going on with your feet. So in a higher wind situation, I feel like I'm just going to go ahead and take the time to get all the buckles undone and then swim out and try to not kick too much so I don't have so I can get the lines around me. Okay, so tell us everything about what was the plan for this particular... This time I was fully buckled in. It's going to do a downwind landing. And my plan was to kind of skim the water and throw my weight backwards to see if I could land with my chest upwards and buckle out that way. But the impact was pretty fast and it definitely flipped me forward really quick. So once I was underwater, I just went right to the buckles and got out of the harness, swam away from the motor, looked up for lines, didn't see many or any, and then uh, surfaced and had a couple lines to deal with, but nothing major. If it had been rough, 
a rough sea, I think I would have been fine as well. But if it was a fast moving river, that might be different. Part of me is almost like, if I could only have one flotation device, I'd rather have it on me. So that way, once I got away from the motor, I could inflate and then self self rescue, swim back. If it was a, a long distance to go, that sure would be nice to have a float, personal flotation on the swim back. I don't know if it was the reserve, um, the current. I don't know if it was divine intervention. I don't know if it was my strength, but I righted myself. I did one more kick and one more just attempt at rolling and I was completely out of oxygen and I needed that breath and I, I breathed in and and I had a half, a, probably about a half a lung of salt water as I exposed to air and I got air in my lungs as well and it burnt. I was coughing and I righted myself and I was now on my back being pulled out to sea and I was using my hands and I was, I was being pulled so fast that there's actually water pressure on both sides of my hands where I would try and undo the buckles and I'd have to ski with this hand and ski with that hand to keep myself righted um, and balanced upright so I wasn't face down again while I was trying to work these straps out. And, um, but yeah, for, like I said, an hour and 20 minutes I fought for my life and, uh, and I'm still here. So like, when, I first, when I first got in the sport, it was taught you don't fly over water. Like it just was not a thing. Like no one did it, no one talked about it, it didn't happen. If you did, you died. I think you were getting a real symmetrical pull on that wing and then it dipped this way and it just took you and rolled you right onto your face. My takeaway from this is I'm, I'm definitely gonna be more respectful of flying over the water. Because the lines were laying here. My second one, the lines were on the surface here. So as I came out, I had to get a certain distance to come up, and I came up short and came up in the lines. Yeah, sometimes I poop with the lights off. Goddamn fucking flies. Um. Are you okay with? The fact that we haven't got safety divers here in 20 huh? seconds. Got air. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the bullshit that Aaron was pulling stemmed from Byron. I, I'm not one bit surprised. You know, it's it's big. You know, if you if you crash and get paralyzed, then. Byron sitting there trying to tell everyone what to do and then doesn't do anything himself. Come on. This guy's full of jackasses.